Hi everyone, happy new year, happy 2021. Sitting here in Washington DC, uh, right outside uh, what is increasingly becoming a war zone because this week there is a hopefully peaceful transfer of power from one leader to another. Anyway, let's talk about journalism. I sort of stumbled into journalism. At first I wanted to be like a cinematographer, filmmaker. Then I wanted to be a diplomat and I wanted to join the Foreign Service for the United States. Then I learned that I didn't want to do either of those things and that I could actually combine ingredients from both to do this thing called journalism, communicating kind of complex topics of the day to an audience. I didn't go to journalism school. I didn't formally study this, but I ended up becoming what most would call a journalist. Over the years, I've learned a few things about journalism that I want to share with you. I assign a reporter to get all the important facts and to write the story. I also assign a news photographer to take pictures. The reporter and photographer will work together as a team. Now the reporter has all the facts. He's ready to write his story. He puts the most important facts in the first few sentences. Then he adds the interesting details. So let's make a list here. Number one, objectivity is a myth. There's no such thing as objectivity. I often find myself in these conversations where people are just like, if there was just unbiased, objective news, all of our problems in the media would just go away. That's a really attractive idea. But the more I do this, the more I realize that objectivity isn't a thing. It's a theory. It's not a real thing you can ever achieve. Every article you read, every video you watch, every photo you see was produced by a human being who went out and gathered that information and then decided what facts to put down on paper. They chose to frame the issue a certain way, to leave out some stuff and to include other stuff. There were choices there. And those choices were the product of a human and their biases. Even a photojournalist, someone who takes pictures for newspapers, presumably the least biased type of journalism there can be, is still totally subject to bias. The way that photo is cropped and framed and who they decided to take a photo of and at what time and how they decided to expose the frame. All of those are choices. Objectivity is a myth. But what isn't a myth and what's real, and I think what people are sort of getting at when they talk about objectivity is fairness. Being fair to your topic or your subject or the other side of the argument that you're making in your article. My old boss Ezra Klein used to talk about this concept as generosity. We as journalists go out and gather a bunch of information and facts about a thing and then we sort of land somewhere on what we think about that topic. And our journalism, our story, is gonna reflect that decision. But what you can do as a fair journalist is you can be generous to the other side. You can present the best version of the other side's argument. That to me is what healthy journalism has, is generosity to the other side. But objectivity, it just doesn't exist. I experienced this in the first season of Borders when I was uh, in Japan doing that North Korea bubble story. I clearly had a position in that story, but at the same time, I wanted to give the best version, the most generous version of the North Korean viewpoint. And I tried to split that balance while also being clear and assertive about the facts. That's a difficult balance, but when it's done right, it makes for better journalism. Number two, a lot of journalists write for their peers and not for their audience. This is another really useful thing that I learned from Ezra working at Vox. A lot of journalism is hard to understand. That's just a fact. Like even now, when I read the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post or the New York Times, I have a hard time getting around some of the language and some of the things that are happening, especially for topics that I'm sort of new to. I've always felt this and it's always sort of been frustrating because I'm like, aren't you guys writing so that I understand? Like I'm an educated consumer of this news and yet I'm having a hard time understanding. Like that's a problem. A lot of journalism is written for insiders, people who are already kind of familiar with the topic. As a journalist, when you're writing about something that's kind of complex, you start to sort of get in your head. You're like, man, a lot of people are gonna see this and a lot of really smart people are gonna see this. So if I use really simple language, what are my peers gonna think? What are my journalist friends down the road at the Washington Post or the New York Times gonna think about this article if I don't use all the fancy jargon? If I'm explaining the financial crisis in Venezuela, it's a lot more tempting to write something like, hyperinflation has led to the complete devaluation of the local currency, spurring a collapse in wages, which shows my peers that I'm actually really smart. I have a master's degree in international relations and economics. But what about my audience who knows nothing about hyperinflation? They're left feeling left out. 
out and no more informed about the financial crisis in Venezuela. Instead, what I should do is write something like, quote, situation has gotten so bad in Venezuela that the money is worth a thousand times less than it was last year, making those who were once really rich now struggling to find their next meal. It's still accurate, it's still smart, and it's still a, an accurate assertion about what's happening in Venezuela. I'm just not using any of the jargon. If my peers judge me for that, so be it. At least my audience will understand. Number three, journalism has a lot of very old customs or traditions. There are a lot of old practices and habits in journalism that feel like gospel to a lot of people in journalism. One of the big ones that I always run into is that in sort of traditional conventional journalism, we don't say the word I. The journalist is a fly on the wall. We're not there to insert ourselves, our personal character into the story. Therefore, we don't say the word I. And I sort of understand the thinking behind that, even if I don't practice it. The other convention or custom, mainly in like documentary and video journalism, is that we're not here to make things look too beautiful. Beautiful B-roll, evocative music, beautiful motion graphics, those are for like the brands and the corporate people. Here in journalism, we care about the story. And all the fancy stuff is just fluff, not necessary at all. I disagree with both of those. I disagree with the aversion to using I, and I disagree with the aversion to using beautiful imagery and B-roll and music. Luckily, when I came into journalism, I came into an organization that was very eager to disrupt this old set of customs in journalism. Vox really encouraged me to experiment. Thank goodness they did. I was able to start a series that was all about showing beautiful visuals of places around the world, and it had music, and it had motion graphics, and of course, it had a lot of turning the camera on myself and talking to the camera. I was a character in the story, and I would go to these conferences, these journalism conferences, and I would always get sort of interrogated by these legacy news people who were like, can you really consider this journalism? And my response was always, I don't know. Like you can decide. I don't, I'm not here to chase the label of journalism. I'm here to tell stories about people and to bring big audiences to those stories. The reality is a lot of these customs are sort of arbitrary and they were developed at a different time when information was shared differently. Let me caveat just one big thing here by saying that a lot of these norms and a lot of these customs and ethics within journalism are actually really useful. The idea of staying honest and fact-based and accurate and making sure that your assertions actually have some evidence to them, I am all for that. I love that there is a very strong tradition and burden of evidence within journalism that says if you can't prove it, it's not real. Especially because a lot of those customs, which I believe are the really important customs of factual information, are sort of going out the window. And if you need proof of that, just go five miles away from me to the Capitol like a week ago and see how that was covered by journalists on both sides. But when it comes to the formats, the, oh, that guy turned the camera on himself or did a bunch of drone shots and therefore it's not journalism. I'm here to tell stories that have facts and data and characters and help inform people. If you decide to call that journalism or not, I don't really care, that's how I do it. But I guess the lesson here is that if you're going into journalism, those are really serious, intense customs that you will come in contact with. Which gets me to my next lesson, which is number four. Journalism school isn't always the best way to get into journalism. Now, let me just pause for a second and make it clear that I am not saying don't go to journalism school. Most of the people who have taught me what I know about the craft of journalism went to journalism school and I am deeply grateful, thank you, Joss Fong and others, for teaching me how to do journalism when I frankly didn't know what I was doing when I walked in the door the first day at Vox. But let me make it clear that going to journalism school is not the only or even the best way to get into journalism. Man, I've said journalism, the word journalism, so many times in this video, so it's starting to get to the point where like, the word feels weird to say because I've said it so much. So anyway, my critique of journalism school is the same critique I have of film school, which is something I started and stopped after about a year and a half. The critique for both of these is that the institution spends so much time focusing on theory, tradition, history, critique of the old style of doing it, the old way of doing filmmaking or the old way of doing journalism, that they don't give the students much chance to actually experiment and play around with like the new versions of how this thing is being done. We spend so much time looking back and talking to faculty 
who sort of had their heyday in like the old days, that they don't spend a lot of time doing the type of journalism that happens today, which is under very different circumstances, economically, politically, etc. So my big critique is that there isn't enough in the trenches experience with journalism and that you end up getting a sort of warped version of what you're gonna be doing. And a lot of fixed ideas that are hard to sort of shift when you actually get out into the real world. Now, there are a lot of journalism schools who are doing really great work in this department and letting their students see what it's really like. I go and speak to a lot of these journalism schools, whether it's the University of Oregon or Stanford or Yale or whatever it is. When I speak to students at these schools, I see an appetite from faculty to give these students perspective on what journalism looks like in 2021, what it looks like in this new age of digital journalism, and what are the different versions of journalism that one can go into. The big strength of journalism school is that they teach you the importance of reporting, meaning going out and gathering facts, of fairness, of facts, of accuracy, of evidence, the heart of journalism you learn in journalism school. Absolutely, that is totally irrefutable. I believe in that. But I believe that you get a lot of that fluff on top of the customs and how you're supposed to do journalism and what is and what isn't. And those fixed ideas, if they root too deeply, can hinder you once you get out into the field. Go there, learn, like go for it, but make sure you don't get too entrenched on what journalism is and isn't. The next lesson is that journalism is economic in its very nature. It has to be. It is a business. Just watched Little Women, the new one with Hermione. It was really good. I watched Little Women a bunch growing up, but I never really got it. And then I watched this one and it totally made sense and I loved it. Anyway, there's this amazing line in there where she says, So don't sit there and tell me that marriage isn't an economic proposition because it is. Journalism is an economic proposition, meaning if you're starting a journalism outlet in the United States, you are doing so as a business. You need to keep your lights on and your doors open by selling something, whether it's subscriptions or whether it's ads or whether it's some other new version of economic value that you can create with your journalism, you have to do that. And with that comes a certain set of expectations and incentives that aren't necessarily aligned with the incentives of telling really good stories. And now, of course, I've ranted about this in a previous video called Why I Hate the News. I'm not gonna go into the depths of my thoughts on this. If you want to go watch that video, you should. But whenever I go speak at a journalism conference in Europe, I always chat with them about the economics of journalism in Switzerland or the Netherlands or whatever. And in Europe, they've really realized that like private media can get out of control and can lead to some really bad outcomes. And so they really try to buffer the media machine from private interests. And they do so in a pretty good job. There's still private media in Europe. But here in the United States, private media is the name of the game. And the effects of these incentives on journalism are very apparent. We are incentivized to chase volume, to chase numbers, to chase like a little bit of like what's gonna get people to click. It's hard to compete when the information landscape is incentivizes us to be in that environment. Money usually comes from attention and advertising, not necessarily subscribers who pay a monthly fee for your newspaper. And attention and traffic are not always conducive to telling the best story or doing the best journalism, which is a real travesty. The best thing that took the most time, the biggest article that has the most information is not actually the most valued among the attention economy. But anyway, I'm not here to lament human psychology. I do offer two pieces of hope to this capitalistic incentive of the media quandary. Number one is that there are still really great outlets that publish really in-depth media and that you just have to pay money to. And by doing so, you shield the need for them to have to just chase pure volume. One of my favorite outlets of all time and where I get most of my news and my ways of thinking about the world is a British weekly magazine called The Economist. And I pay for it. I like to consume media that I know was crafted by the incentives of serving me, the paying customer, as opposed to serving a different master, which is an advertiser who will keep them afloat. There's still a lot of amazing media that happens through advertiser revenue. It just is a fact. Most media had to pivot to that. But more and more, those incentives are pushing media into more sensationalized, polarized places. Okay, my second piece of hope here is that when I joined Vox, we were just sort of taking off. We had less than 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. It was like the early days. And there was this hypothesis among the whole organization, which was like a few dozen people, that if we could 
tell really good stories and explain really complicated things to people that we would actually win the views game. Like people would actually come to us instead of the funny cat video because they actually want to understand. People actually want to engage with good information. And it turns out that that hypothesis was totally correct. The most popular videos I ever made at Vox, one, a six minute explainer of a complex Middle Eastern war, really complicated, but got hundreds of millions of views. And another really popular video I made was a 10 minute video explaining the housing policy crisis and tax law in Hong Kong. Like some of the most boring but important information you could ever think of. But because they were presented in a way that people could access, it actually made them really popular. And people said, yes, I want to understand what's going on with the Syrian civil war because everyone's talking about it and I don't understand it. I will sit through this six minute video. And that video, by the way, took off not on YouTube, but on Facebook, like the place where people's attention is apparently the lowest and where people are just there to click on whatever's sensational. That's a problem that's happening, but you can still get people to watch really in-depth stuff if it's well told and well presented. So that that's a hopeful thing to my, to my little lament about the economics of journalism. Man, I'm getting deep right now. I'm getting like deep into my theory Theories of journalism. Yeah, yeah, this is good. This is good. Let's get on to the next lesson. Number six, good writing is rare and beautiful. What I've learned in journalism is that the difference between someone really connecting with a story and not connecting with a story is just a few words. Good writing, whether it's for a video or a text-based article, it can bring you into a story. It can illuminate a topic. It can humanize a character. It's really important. I wasn't very good at writing when I started at Vox. And over the years, I had some really good story editors who would look at my writing and help me reshape it and simplify it and make it more concise and make it clearer. I am grateful for the people who taught me how to write because a lot of the videos you see on this channel, yeah, there is beautiful maps and there's fancy footage and there's lots of drone shots and whatever. But at the end of the day, behind all of that, the reason why you're interested in watching those videos is because I put a major priority on writing. I spend so much time choosing my words so that every story I tell sinks in on the other side when you're listening. And that's because good journalism is good writing at the end of the day, and it's incredibly important. If you wanna get better at writing, I have a book for you. I'm gonna put the link in the description. If I forget to do that, call me out in the comments because I don't wanna forget because I wanna tell you about this book. I mean, I could just say it right now and then you could just go find it, but oh, but if I put it in this link in the description, I could make it an affiliate link and then I could get money every time you click it. Man, the incentives of the 21st century economy are just playing on my mind right now. Oh gosh. Okay, the last lesson here, good journalism is important. Now hear me out on this, this might sound trite, but I've learned over the years that journalism is hard. To go out and gather information that doesn't exist in the world and to communicate it to the rest of the world is, is hard. Our country these past few months has shown me just how important and how sort of delicate good journalism can be. Facts don't matter for a lot of people these days. And before you know it, you can have a person in power creating fake stories about an election. And you can have a news outlet that claims to be doing journalism jump on board with that narrative and make up facts to support it. That's scary. Good journalism, the stuff where people are going out and actually scrutinizing evidence and presenting robust arguments to a, an audience that is scrupulous back towards them and there's a, dis a discussion and a discourse, that's rare and special. Here in the United States, we call it the fourth estate, this institution of free press that keeps our leaders honest, keeps our corporations honest, keeps our society together and honest. There will always be people and institutions whose sole purpose is to gain. Journalism offers a spotlight or a watchdog on those actors, on those institutions. And because of that, it's really, really important. I am very, very grateful for those journalists, especially right now, at this time in history, where covering the facts is so freaking important for keeping our society peaceful and together and honest and working. I just am grateful for the good journalism that's happening. The people are out there hustling. And I lament the hostility that has been shown towards those people. And I hope we can move on um, and get back to facts and truth.
Thanks for watching. This video uh, is sponsored by Squarespace, which is an all-in-one platform where you can create any sort of online presence you want, whether it's a portfolio for your videos or for your photography, or you are launching a business and you want to have an online presence that isn't just a website, but also a place where you can do email campaigns and SEO so that your website shows up on search or integration with social media, whatever it is. Squarespace is a place where you can create online presence that is beautiful. And it's really quick and easy. It's like a drag and drop few minutes and you could have a literal website live on the internet. I love Squarespace, have for a long time, and um, I'm grateful that they support this channel. There's a link in my description where if you click it, it helps support this channel, but it also gives you 10% off your first purchase at Squarespace. Whether it is hosting space or a domain name or whatever, you get 10% off if you click that link. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you patrons, like always. Like I've now had a Patreon for like maybe six months or maybe more. And I'm just, I sort of thought like, man, the patrons are gonna be there for a few minutes. And then like after month two, they're all just gonna flee, but they haven't. And I'm so grateful because it helps support my work. I have some very zesty videos coming out in the next, couple weeks. Get ready for those. Just telling you, like how the US stole the Middle East part two. I know you all have been asking for it. It's coming. All right. See you all in the next one. Have a good day. Happy New Year. Bye. This is the plan for page 10. Then he writes a headline, a title for the story. Then the printed story is checked against the original story to make certain that there are no mistakes. Warning light. The presses are starting to roll. Newspapers are sold on the streets. Newspapers are delivered to homes and they are read everywhere. I like my job, helping to bring the news to our community.